Hello everyone. I hope all of you are doing well and you're staying safe, you're staying home. Uh this is a very strange situation that we're all in and uh the normal as we knew it at the beginning of this year doesn't exist anymore. And it's the normal as such is in a state of flux. What it will be is the new normal once all this is over. And a state of flux is to me always a very exciting time because it could be with me being gemini we love change we love growth we love uh adrenaline basically so there's uncertainty which if you change the filter and look at it is potential for growth potential for new things and what struck me is no matter how old we get and how many kids we have when you hear the term principal at a very deep level the school kid in you wakes up and you're like is my hair okay have i cut my nails and, and you know i've got to sit up straight <laughs> and the person that i have on uh with me today is completely the opposite of everything that we uh define the word principal as or at least principal as i know him so mr matthew burfield principal and ceo of the gems founder schools uh i wish i had him as my principal mr matthew i really do if you were to see him in action in school he's like a rock star the little ones come out they want to hug him they want to tell him all about their day so that's on one end of the spectrum then you have the older kids years 11 12 13 and they want to take pictures with him they want to tell him about their day they want to hang out with him and somebody who can bridge those two age groups to me is a superstar and uh, i think that's what an educator needs to be somebody who's just real and grounded and that kids can relate to and we as parents feel that we can relate to him too so mr burfield it's such a pleasure to have you on today and uh, i'm sure that all our viewers will really benefit from uh, what you have to say so would you like to introduce yourself and maybe tell us what brought you to where you are today Well look firstly you are incredibly kind and what what lovely words I'm not sure I can actually follow those words to be honest that's such a an amazing introduction I don't think I've had better um and I hope that every word is true I know you feel it but I hope that uh, around our community they feel it too um so my name is Matthew Burfield and I'm the the principal CEO of Gems Founders in Dubai um I'm the person that founded the school started the school and and first saw it when it was only desert just sand nothing else Um so that was over four and a half years ago now it was just sand. Um and so I I've been the person that's seen it grow from 1800 children on the first day um to now 4260 children the building's complete we have 3 year olds all the way to 18 year olds and the whole range um of abilities an incredibly inclusive wonderfully diverse community that we've built um and I say we because it's been a, a whole team of people um obviously as the leader you know, I get a lot of the lovely praise and the beautiful words that you've just said um but actually I'd be completely lost without my team who have done everything to ensure that our children have the very best value for money education in the UAE um and we've achieved that and gems founders as a brand has achieved that um and it's something that no matter what i do in the future i'm going to be incredibly proud of this point in my life where we've provided something that nobody else could um and we've actually started and something i feel has started to change the paradigm in the educational landscape here in the UAE mm. where we've shown people that you can offer this amazing value of education and yeah. still have the highest expectations possible Absolutely. that's something that wasn't being done before founders came onto the market so it's something i'm very proud of um a little bit about how i got here I, i'll tell you a, sh- a short story i guess or as short as i can make it but okay. a short story of my journey um, <laughs> and it actually starts when i was a child um my my mother was a a deputy head of school in a primary school in england um and a special needs coordinator uh, okay. for many of years of her career so um i was one of those children that got to see their parents come home happy from work um which mm. is not very often actually i i realized with many of my friends as i grew into a teenager that that wasn't the norm yes. um but in my life that was the norm i saw my mum come home happy um very busy always tired but very happy with what she'd achieved so mm. i think that journey and that pathway started for me then um to become a teacher um and i think then you start to think well what type of teacher do i want to be um and where do i want to follow that next path and i had one of the most amazing history teachers in my secondary school um his name was mr watson 
Um, and uh, I always laugh and joke that uh, that's probably why I became a history teacher, but also definitely why I grew a beard, because <laughs> Mr. Watson had the best beard that I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> okay. But he inspired me to follow history. He inspired me to teach history to secondary school children, which is then uh, what I went on to train and do. Um, mm. And my, my pathway in teaching started very differently to where I am now. Um, I started in schools in southeast London. Um, in the borders of, of Peckham um, and Camberwell, uh, Herne Hill, etc. So if anybody knows those names, they'll know what I mean by the borders of South East London. Um, but challenging, challenging school, um, a school that had been reopened, had been closed um, and then reopened. And what that meant for me um, was the ability to work with children who came from very disadvantaged backgrounds, very mm. disadvantaged neighbourhood. Um, and I spent the first 10 years of my life through Peckham and then into Brixton, um, working in these quite disadvantaged, challenged neighbourhoods um, and loved every minute of it. Um, absolutely loved every minute of it. Um, it was exhausting though. Um, and at some point when you've been children's social workers, carers, fathers, teachers and everything else um, it does drain you and there, there yes, is a limit to what you can do in those types of environment in my opinion so I looked for other opportunities I started to think well what else could I do mm. um, and I started to apply for international education I thought that I'll, I'll move into my first headship um, and I took over my first headship when I was 31 years old um, wow. in, in Athens Greece yeah um, and it was a, a lovely little school in Athens Greece um, with just it was about 250 children um, from three to 18 years old so you can imagine a one class entry school beautiful little place uh, called Byron College in Athens okay. Greece um, and that's where I got to really be a head teacher for the first time and learn what it meant to create that culture and what it meant to be the person in charge of a school um, and ultimately in charge of all those things um, mm -hmm. whether they be the logistics or the academics um, yes. And then I guess that takes us to this part of my journey, which is moving to, to founders and moving to Dubai. Mm. Um, and I hadn't intended to leave Athens, if I'm honest. It, it was a place that I could have easily retired in. Um, it was a lovely little school, beautiful community. It, it still is. Um, and it's a place where you could easily retire and just enjoy being an educator. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, you know, knowing my first headship at 31, I, I had a bit more drive than that. Yes. And so I wanted to move to something else and I was actually approached by GEMS Education through LinkedIn um, mm. and, and asked if I would like to come over and see what they have to offer and have a conversation with them. Um, so I came over to Dubai and as all people who arrive here first was wowed by the buildings and the amazing yes. treatment of people and I just yeah the whole the whole Dubai culture yeah, there's nothing that prepares you for it until you come and live it and breathe yeah. it. Um, and then I still wasn't completely convinced until Gems then told me it was a brand new Greenfield site school. Because I think for any head teacher or school leader, that's an extremely exciting prospect to take something that is new, that doesn't exist, that yeah. has no history, um, and to make that community and that culture. Um, mm. And so that was something I was very, very excited by. Um, the initial target for us was 400 children to open with 400 children. Um, okay. So that felt reasonable to me. Um, obviously, I think the story tells very clearly we opened actually with 1,881 <laughs> children um, on the very first day of <laughs> Talk operation. Talk about exceeding um, targets. <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. I moved to 3,200 children by the second year. And now, as I said, we're at full capacity and we opened a second founder school, which I also um, work with the principal and lead. Um, and I also support one of the other GEM schools, GEMS Metropole School. So I also work with the principal there now um, just to bring them up to that good standard where we already are because we were the first school in our market to ever get a good in the first inspection. So we, we continue to break the records in Dubai. Um, and as I said, shift that educational paradigm and that landscape which is so important for me. It's really critical. If you go back to those roots in Peckham and Brixton, I, I've continued that same concept of wanting to challenge education and transform lives at the most important stage for those who are perhaps in a bit more need and even Absolutely. in Dubai context, a bit more disadvantaged necessarily, yes. but only in Dubai yes. context. Exactly. So your whole journey has been about stretching yourself and, and stretching the bar, uh, raising the bar. So how do you find this state that we're currently in stretching you what have you gained in this process what do you find yourself uh discovering about yourself 
Yeah, I don't think anything's prepared any of us for this, which is interesting. <laughs> I, 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 wish, I wish I could say all the lovely educational leadership courses that I did and the postgraduate studies and everything prepared. <laughs> None of it prepared me for this yeah. um, at all. Um, and I think what, for me, the interesting part that I've definitely learned from this is it has proven to us all who actually are the important people in our society. Absolutely. Um, who are the people that actually keep communities going when mm -hmm. everything else is failing? And yes. so, you know, we talk about our front line with the nurses and doctors. Well, I think we all knew they were important, but it's proven even more so to us. Um, but those people that perhaps we hadn't considered as important, you know, the people working in our grocery shops, our pharmacists, the delivery, delivery boys and boys, girls. Yes. You know, oh, I mean, we'd be all lost without them right yeah. now. Um, but I also feel one of the lovely things that's come out of this is the importance of teachers. Um, mm -hmm. Because in many cultures, it's still upheld as a very important profession, yeah. but not in all. Um, and I think that it's changed that a little bit in people's minds. And it's gone, actually, that is the person that keeps my routine going. That is the person that continues to connect with my child. Um, that is the person. And, and actually, our teachers are working harder now than they have ever worked before. Yes. Um, because they're creating material that they've never created before. Yeah. There isn't any online subscription they can go to and download mm -hmm. things they're having to create it and use it yeah. um, and I think that they're working harder but the identification of them as key workers yes. um, I think that's the first time in generations that that's happened as teachers being identified <clears throat> as key workers um, and for me that is critical because the profession is as important as anything else um, and I, I just love that it's now being promoted in that yeah sense. there's some hilarious videos out there of parents yeah. begging teachers to forgive them and take the kids I, back. I've seen a few of those that get shared on my WhatsApp group regularly. Yeah. But there are some brilliant. And I think just giving parents that experience of what it's like. And of mm -hmm. course, parents are getting that with one, two, maybe three children. We know that teachers do it with 30 children every single moment yeah. of every single day. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely proven to people that teachers are well-trained, well-experienced yeah. and yeah not everybody can do their job, which is perhaps what people believed before, but mm. I don't think they're going to believe it at the end of this. So if you want a silver lining for me, that's a real silver lining that we've, we've really identified and understood that education is one of the pillars of society, but the people holding that pillar up are the teachers, the teaching assistants, the admin staff, all those people behind the scenes as well. They're the ones that are holding actually our entire community together right now um, because they're the people that are giving routines. And, and I know as a principal, I feel that constantly that I'm the one holding that piece together, but also holding those parental communities together, um, answering hundreds and hundreds and thousands of emails yes. <laughs> um, and trying to connect with parents without actually being able to see them and, and yes. understand what they're yeah. going through, which, which is a challenge, definitely. And, and that actually brings me to my next question, because, um, you know, I'm an executive master coach. I work with executives, with CEOs, and I come from a corporate background where I did the same thing. I worked with the CEO and C-suite. And um, most of them deal with a certain set of stakeholders. Your role is very unique in that there is no stakeholder that you do not have a direct dealing with because you're dealing with your peers, as you said, other principals, you're, you're, you're dealing up with the board, you're dealing with your staff, with parents, with students, and especially you, because I know uh, for a fact that you have a very personal and vested interest in having that personal connection with your students. So um, very quickly, if you could use your coat of many colors and many titles, and, and uh, if you could share some tips with each of these, so your peers, for instance, people who are at us, maybe in different industries, but playing a similar role to you, what tips would you give them to uh, make the most of this time and get through it successfully? So, I mean, it's, you're exactly right, is, is that multifaceted approach to being a principal is something that does make the role incredibly challenging all over the world and always has. Um, one of the things that I love about that, though, is that I've always had two very core, simple beliefs when it comes to any type of school leadership role. So whether that be a, an assistant principal on a particular area or a principal who oversees all of it, um, and that's relationships and communication. And, and these two, for me, have always upheld everything I did, even when I was an NQT history teacher. The relationships that you build with all those stakeholders are absolutely critical. Our community right now, if we didn't have strong relationships, would completely fall apart 
because there are so many of our parents, and I, I mentioned the hundreds and hundreds of emails, many of those are parents reaching out and saying, you know what, you're doing an amazing job, guys. We're here with you. We support you. We want, we want you to do well. We are part of this community. That hasn't come by accident. That's come mm. because we've spent hours and days and weeks and yes. months building those relationships. Yeah. So relationships are really critical. And we've noticed the difference between those parents who've been with us for one, two, three years compared to those who've just joined this year, for instance, and who haven't quite got that bond with the community yet. So for me, advice to everybody, take time and build relationships. That means personal contact. That means reaching out. That means answering every single email that comes into a principal email box personally. Yeah. And, and that is to the detriment of my own health, I promise you something. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, but the reality is, is you as a parent know when it's Matthew answering compared to when it's his PA of answering course. or compared to when it's somebody else answering. Yes. So that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have to know that you are going to be there to answer it. Even if some of those emails are really difficult, really challenging, and they you know, can ruin your day because they can sometimes, some of those emails. Yeah. Um, but we must answer them personally. We mm. must continue that relationship with those Personal parents who connection. trust us. They yeah. have to trust us. And then that brings me to the second part, which is communication. Now, communication is critical at all levels. Mm. That means me doing short videos on social media and making sure we connect and we have that yes. communication. Me making sure that we send the newsletter out still. We send out letters to, st to staff, parents, and we communicate with our children. Yes. And one of the things that we've done, which is very different, I think, to many schools is, yes, we've done the parent surveys and GEMS still do that one as well. And they make mm. sure that we get all that parental feedback and we've responded to that as we have since the day we opened the doors. What we've done though is we've also asked for lots of student feedback and that's all the way down to year three. We've asked for children to tell us how they feel, children to communicate to us, how their remote learning's going, what can we do to support them more? So mm. that's, that gives us that multifaceted approach. Yep. We've also asked staff. Staff have done a self-assessment okay. of their own teaching, of their own mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. but also we've done a separate well-being survey with staff to make sure that their, their well-being's checked, to make sure yes. that they're okay to make sure they know that we care about them. Sure. So if you take all those levels of communication with all those stakeholders, they all come down to the same thing, which is caring and kindness. And one of the things I hold very true, I started this, this interview with, with talking about my mum. One of the things that's always been really important to me is caring and kindness. And, mm. you know, it costs nothing to use a phrase of my, my mother's and I'm sure many mothers around the world, <laughs> but you know, kindness costs nothing, exactly. but it is so, so important right now. It is so easy to send out an email that is abusive or that is aggressive because you're mm. feeling abused yeah. and aggressive. Yeah. It's so easy to do. But in your role as a coach, and you know, you know, many of the times where I've had to coach people through those things, what you do is you try to, to talk them through and help them understand what that feels like. What does it feel like receiving an email that is like that, where it is just you offloading your feelings? Yeah. Now, if that's all you're using it for, that's fine. If you're not expecting a response and you're just venting, go for it. You know, I'll file it and that's absolutely fine. But if you're expecting a response from anybody in this world, be mm. kind, show yeah. that you care and actually be respectful and courteous. Those things, when it comes to communication, will always work, whether it's a little three-year-old, whether yeah. it's a granddad, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a parent, whether it's Mr. Sonny Valky, our chairman and founder himself, courtesy, respect, kindness and care. Those things always align with communication and they link me back to the bit where I started. They also help you build relationships. Exactly. So those two things are just intrinsically linked like a, a little Venn diagram. They're mm -hmm. so important to everything that you do with any level of stakeholder. And if it were a Venn diagram, there would be an overlap with respect in the middle. <laughs> I, I think so. I, I genuinely think that if you don't start with that basis, um, you can't then expect the, the desired outcome. And the desired outcome for you as a parent, for me as a principal, and for your, your wonderful child as well, is for her to have the best educational experience possible yeah. in our school. That's all. Of, we all want the same thing. Yes. So if we all keep that in our mind, mm. that will always bring us back to the same point of supporting each other to deliver that. Because an abusive email to a teacher that makes them feel bad and sad and maybe makes them ill that's not going to help your child. No. Actually, your child's probably going to miss two or three days of learning because that teacher's in bed trying to recover from what you've said to them. You know, so it doesn't help anybody. So if we keep the core value, children's learning and progress at the middle, 
actually, you'd never send that email. You may still be angry, but yes. you'd write it in a way that helps people understand where your anger comes from so they can help you solve it. I or think follow, that's the some people get. Or follow another piece of uh, old advice, which is count to 10. Put yourself in a better place. Yeah. And then write that email so that you're no Absolutely. longer in that state of anger. And, and uh, it's such an interesting point when you mentioned how your mother inspired you, and which is something I just say so often, that children do as we do and not as we say. So we feel that we're teaching them all the right things because we're saying those things to them. But they're just quietly absorbing the way we live our lives, the way we respond to people, the way we are enjoying something. And that's what they're taking away. And, and the same goes for teachers because I, to date, uh, that's, I was never on Facebook. And then when I started my management consultancy, I had to get on to, you know, start reaching new people. <clears throat> and I recently connected with my year, uh, year three teacher who has always been for me uh, a role model as a teacher and as a human being. Because as you, when you spoke about kindness, she just popped into my mind, Mrs. Medora. Uh, she taught us the value of being kind and of stepping into someone else's shoes when we were in year three because we had a kid who'd lost his voice uh, as a result of his older brother dying and he was shocked and he couldn't speak and the way she brought us all together and you know this bunch of little boys who would normally have bullied or teased him suddenly became his fiercest protectors and you know they were there looking out for him and coming and asking her what can we do to help him get over this and and i think she has had a lasting effect on a whole load of adults out there in the world now doing God knows how many things because that seed of kindness was sown at that age. So uh, I come from a family with a lot of teachers. I teach myself, my husband teaches at a university, my brother, my aunt, you know. <laughs> but um, teachers' impact is so much more than just the subject they're teaching because a good teacher will teach you to be a better human being. And a good teacher will will uh, inculcate self-confidence in you because to date I hate mathematics. And that's because of some lousy teachers who, who just, you know, made me feel I wasn't good enough. So uh, it's, it's the value of a teacher extends far beyond that. So I will take this moment to say a heartfelt thank you to teachers everywhere. We see you, we recognize you, and we thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm your I'm sure that they will all really appreciate that. Your advice actually covered all the, the groups. Now, when it comes to students, uh, Mr. Burfield, what would you say to them? Because this is a time of particular stress and anxiety, especially for the ones who were planning to go into uni in the next semester, and now the boards have been canceled. You know, for them, as it is, you're at that age when your body and mind are going through so many changes, and, and your whole life is a bit all over the place, and now this is thrown into the mix. What would you tell them to help them get through this? I, I think you've, you've hit the nail right on the head with those older children. And it's not that this is not affecting all children. I wouldn't want to negate the impact mm, on mm. three and four year olds, but you're absolutely right that those year 11s and year 13s particularly um, in our school who were planning university or our year 11s were planning that next step into sick form, mm. this has deeply affected them because the exam system has changed radically. Yes. Um, instead of preparing and sitting for that two, three hour exam that you will sit once and that will prove everything you've done for the last two years, we're now being asked by our exam boards to bring together a range of evidence that mm. we then submit to our exam boards, whether that be Oxford or Cambridge for our school, we submit to those exam boards and they will calculate a grade based on that range of evidence. Yeah. Now, this is a whole new way of doing things. And, and actually, one of the things that you started by saying was about the concept of what will we take through after this is all finished? Because yeah. there is an end to this. There, there is a, yes. an outcome at the end. And we will all be back in schools one day yeah. very soon, hopefully, um, where we'll all be sitting with each other and talking about, wow, do you remember what happened back in, in 2020? But the reality is, is I'm hoping that exam boards consider this process and actually look at it and think, well, what were the benefits of this? For me, the benefits for our children right now far outweigh the negatives. Yeah. And, and if I was speaking directly to, to Shreya or any of the others, I'd tell them this and I'd make it clear to them and say, you've got to understand that actually this could 
completely benefit the next steps of your life. Mm. Because now what our exam boards have said is instead of relying on that one day, and yeah. we've all had bad days in our life, every single one of us. Um, you know, I had a bad day in my economics A-level exam, for instance, nearly failed. I only managed to scrape through with an E-grade. It was an awful day for yeah. many, many reasons. Yeah. But I had to sit that exam and that was it. It was that one day. Yeah. What we're now being asked to do by the exam boards is take two years of evidence mm. to show the progress of children. Not only that, but for our A-level students, we're being asked what was their prior attainment? How did they do at GCSE? What were they looking at in the CBSE board exams that they maybe did before? We're getting to gather all that evidence together and then submit it for those children. Mm. So instead of them relying on that one day, we're yes. actually being given an opportunity to go to those children and say, we're now looking at everything you did over the course of this. It no longer sits on that one day. And it also sits with your teachers who, mm. is, as you rightfully said, are, are the role models of everybody's life. We all have a Miss Medora or a Mr. <laughs> Watson. We've all got somebody that we yeah. remember. Um, but that role model who, who mostly loves and cares for you and wants yeah. you to do well yeah. has now been empowered by the exam boards to collect the evidence to show that you are an A student, a B student, a C student, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. that they're being asked to do this. Mm -hmm. So in my sense, from my perspective, genuinely, this is a time where I hope children do better than they've ever done before mm -hmm. because our teachers are doing it because it's yeah. a range of evidence and because we're building towards something. Yes. But I also very much hope that this continues in the future and that yes. we stop relying on these one moments at the end of two it's years. Long overdue, I think. Hours. I, I think decades overdue. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you speak to any educator, all of us d dislike exams. All of us think that it's a process that is very archaic um, and something that doesn't prove the best children. It proves those who are best at passing exams. That's all it proves. It proves <laughs> exactly. One skill. Oh, your kids will love you for saying yeah. that out loud. So, yes. Well, I'm hoping that they take that and they really believe what I'm yes. saying, which is that this is the best chance for us to prove to our examination boards and to the government back in the UK that actually we can give the best grades possible to children that deserve it because mm. they have worked for two years for this, not just yes. for one day and because yes. they're good at passing exams. Yeah. So I'm hoping that's the silver lining for me coming out of all this. Actually, we may change the entire um, landscape when it comes to examinations across all of the boards and across all of the different curricula. Mm. So for me, uh, what's getting me personally through this is that uh, it's the belief I've always had that this too shall pass. Everything, everything changes. Good times, bad times, nothing lasts forever. So this too will, will come to an end, as you said. And uh, the faith, having deep faith and having the belief that after a time of turbulence comes good. And then you look beyond the here and now to you know, set your sight on that good time because then that pulls you through this and it, it makes this time seem shorter. Uh, so that's one. And then two is to use this time to look inward uh, and, and learn more about myself because when we are on that hamster wheel, we're just running at full speed and we have no time to even take a breath. So I'm discovering things about myself and I uh, welcome families to pause and just get to know each other better as well, especially parents. Um, we create these little humans and when they're small, they're so much made in our image that we feel that they're just our extensions. And then we sometimes make the mistake of continuing to apply that assumption as they actually grow into their own personalities. And uh, I just would like parents to use this time to connect with your children, setting aside whatever your perception of who they are, who you'd like them to be is, set that to aside and just try to connect with your child. Who is this person who is in this moment in front of you? What are their interests? What books are they reading? Are they not interested in reading? Do they like movies? What kind of movies? What is the music they like? Please don't say the music of our time was the best and it will never come around again. That's not true. 
That's not true. And if you listen to your kids' music, you can connect to them so much more. Trust me. So, so you know, parents, if they can understand what is it that you love doing, what is it that drives you, that would help you in giving your child the advice they need as they uh, decide on their future courses in academics. I'm sure, Mr. Burfield, you agree with me, because otherwise we're trying to live vicariously and we're, I always wanted to be a doctor. I couldn't. So guess what? You're going to be doing medical school for you. It's not fair. So, so uh, if parents could do that and children in return, if you can stop uh, just, you know, using a format painter on your parents, you, you know that some other parent is like this and therefore all parents, including yours, they just don't get us. So uh, use this time, try to connect because you'd be surprised to know parents are, uh, sorry for my French, but they're shit scared too, because we've never done this before and uh, we're doing our best. And as a coach, I see that the worst mistakes often come from a place of deep, deep love. So uh, this is a great time because we're sort of trapped together. We might as well make the most of it and get to see and uh, step into each other's shoes and, and walk a day in, in each other's shoes and get to know each other. I think it could help build relationships so that we're not all hiding in our rooms and, and waiting for this to get out. Let's just come together, find things we have in common. You might find that your parents have interests that are similar to yours and perhaps they set it aside because adulthood and adulting and making a living just took over. So use that time. Uh, and, and I'm confidently saying all this because I know Mr. Burfield is the kind of guy who would agree with all of that because I have seen the... <laughs> because when I see your staff, the, the passion and the joy that they bring to their teaching, Mr. Burfield, that, again, from having worked with leadership teams, I know that it, it's something that you follow the leader. And when you set that tone of, as you said, your mother found her job, gave her joy. And I can see that you are living it because I see it in your staff. And then by extension, I see it in your kids because they are so happy to go to school and they, they have this relationship with their teachers. And, and my husband and I keep saying, man, can you imagine us being like that with our teachers? And we wish we could. So, so you're doing such a great job. What is it? that helps you to continue to carry that joy and that strength which so many people are plugging into. So you don't get drained, but you continue to be the source of strength for all of them. What is it that's seeing you through this time? So I just want to reflect firstly on what you've said there, which is just, I, I agree with that. I've said it twice to you as you were speaking, but 100% what you're saying there about that connection. And, and I've got a little eight-year-old girl and a six-month-old boy. So I'm, I'm using those extra minutes where perhaps I would have been in the car traveling to work. Yes. I'm now taking those 20 minutes and seeing them. And, you know, he's six months old. And, and because of my job and because it is seven days a week and nonstop, actually, I've probably missed those first three, four months of his life. Yeah. I, I've been there and I've done what dads can do when yes. they work so hard but I, I I probably miss bits whereas now I'm getting to see that lovely growth part and mm -hmm. with my daughter I'm just enjoying every single moment of it so to answer your question though the strength and and for me and it may sound a bit soppy but for me the actual strength comes from uh, from my wife um the reality is is that I couldn't do any of this and actually you know we've been together now many years um all the <laughs> way through the journey I mean from the moment I moved to London all the way up to now so it is 19 years um, but we've been together a long time and the reality is I've taken that strength from her because she's an incredibly strong woman yeah. um, she's a she's a professional herself a, a PhD from Imperial College London in molecular biology yeah. um, worked in cancer research for most of her life in London um, okay. and continue to work for Mohammed bin Rashid University out here um, so an incredibly strong woman who, who does everything that you imagine strong women can do which yeah. is hold together a house a family um, and also <laughs> yes. does all the professional uh, all yeah. the professional so she though is absolutely a pillar of strength in my life she's the mm. moment when i am feeling crushed when i am feeling down when i have had a a very difficult day which happens regularly yes. because you're she's a human being at 100 and i <laughs> and i wouldn't want to pretend i'm anything but um and she's the person that i can then go to though with that complete trust yeah. tell her how i feel be mm. completely open and be be very vulnerable which again, in our positions as leaders can sometimes be challenging. We, yes. we can use vulnerability strategically and, it, and mm -hmm. it can be useful, don't get me wrong, but yeah. 
most people don't want yes. to see their leaders vulnerable. Yes. So the reality is, is that I have to be that with somebody and, and I can be that with, with this amazing, wonderful woman that's in my life. Um, and so she is the person that allows me to do what I do. She's mm. the person that allows me to now sit in this room for 12, 14 hours a day <laughs> and do my work and, yeah. and not be disturbed and not have to stress or worry about things yes. um, and then can come out and, and she's taking care of everything. And I, mm. I do with them what I can do to support, but um, she's the person that allows me to do all of that. And she's the person that reality checks me yes. when I've gone too far. Yeah. When I have, you know, when I when I'm clearly on burnout mode, which which happens in the cycle yeah. of school leadership, yeah. she's the person that sets me aside and says, "Okay, just so you need to hear this, and I'm the only person that can tell you, I'm telling you." Uh, so you have your own executive coach then. One hundred percent, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I don't have to pay her anything. Yeah, so, you're a lucky, place. lucky man. Very blessed. I, I, I do respect that, yeah, and I know how lucky I am with her every day. So, genuinely, as I said, it does sound a little bit soppy, but that is no. the reality of my life. That is what keeps me centered and grounded. Mm -hmm. That is the reason I was able to be such a successful teacher in London, how I was a leader of, of schools that were very challenging in London. I moved on to my first headship, and now sitting here at 40 years old, I've, I've been a head teacher for nine years, um, and I'm now leading a group of schools, three schools, which in total is uh, just over nine and a half thousand children. Wow. I, I couldn't have done any of that no. uh, without her by my side. It, it's yes. as simple as that. Yes, and, and I'm glad you said that because that's something that I deeply believe in as well, in acknowledging the people who uh, help us on our journey or who are in our corner when we need them because nobody can make it alone, absolutely no one. And I'm glad that I've given you a platform to publicly acknowledge your wife and uh, on on behalf of all our, the grateful parents and students thank you uh, and and thank you so much for being here with us today uh, it's really been a joy and and i was even more thrilled to discover you're a fellow gemini and uh, <laughs> and uh, i as we were discussing a bit before we started uh, the show that uh, you miss interacting with your colleagues and then the students and your corridor chats and we are strong in the hope that the good times will come back soon and that we will all see each other in person quickly and i'm glad that this has given us time to value that because at times it might have got a bit annoying or we might have got a bit tired of it but now we know that it's a good thing and and we miss it when it's not there so uh, thank you so much again i wish you and your family all the best and stay safe and stay healthy everyone you know what i'm going to say stay home thank you thank you very much thank you stay home stay safe yep <laughs>